How evil can humans be? Let's find out. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490, The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. So we've split this into three parts. Um, all three of the parts are going to be describing psychology experiments in which the the intention of the experiment was to find out how evil humans can actually be. Or, or how submissive to evil persons, you know? And these are pretty famous psychology experiments, you know? This is like psychology 101 stuff, but it's fun to talk about. Oh, so. it's yeah, it's a lot of fun to talk about, but you would probably get a better education on it if you took a psychology class. Yeah, but or if you even just like read like articles on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you could also listen to us. That's yeah, fun. You're stuck with us now. You're already partway through. <laughs> the first one I want to focus on is the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was done in 1971 by the renowned psychologist Philip Zimbardo. And the way he did it was he got 24 normal, healthy white males from the Stanford University. So we got a flyer up in the university and people would come in and say to Zimbardo, okay, I want to be part of your experiment. Yeah, but Philip Zimbardo was offering $15 a day for people to go in and do this prison experiment. So he made sure that all of the subjects were healthy, had no history of mental illness, and he made sure that they were basically as normal as possible, normal college students that you'd find on campus. And he put them into a a room which, well, I, I guess it was more of a building that was he kind of shaped it into a prison. It wasn't actually a prison, but he was using it as if it was a prison. He, sorry, he told 12 of the applicants uh, that they would pretend to be prison guards, and he told 12 of them that they were they would pretend to be prison prisoners. You yeah. Know? So the way he determined this was by a coin flip. He would... Yeah, he, he, just, he just had them, you know, randomly assigned so that there, there wasn't going to be bias. Right, he didn't, he didn't just choose the aggressive people of the group to be the guards, of course. So it was just at random. Every Everyone knew that their position was determined by a coin flip, so mm-hmm. they knew that they could have easily just as been a, a, a prison guard, or they could have been a prisoner if the, if they were a guard. Yeah. And uh, another important uh, caveat, uh, after he assigned their roles, um, they were given uniforms. You know, uh, the guards were given military uh, surplus jackets and pants. They were given sunglasses so that they weren't able to make a personal connection connection with the prisoners it was sort of a way to depersonalize and uh dehumanize in a sense yes uh, the, all the people in the room the hypothesis that philip Zimbardo has was that if you have one group that systematically has a way to dehumanize another group then they're going to act on those emotions they're going to be aggressive toward those that other group even if they know that they're just fellow college students even if they know that they could have easily been part of the other group if it was a coin since it was a coin flip they could have yeah. just been on the other side so what they found was uh that on the first day the prisoners basically like joked about it they yeah thought, every they, everything everything was really normal the first day passed uneventfully everyone was just doing their prison things you know well you could imagine like uh yeah. you know if if you were in there and you were, were told to pretend to be a prisoner like wh- what do you even mean by that right yeah, and exactly. if you were told to pretend to be a guard you know you just like oh get in line you <laughs> yeah you know? uh, 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 well uh, because you said you that reminded me another thing they were only allowed to refer to the prisoners by the number on their on their uniform not by their name another tactic of dehumanizing yeah. the subject they, they be like oh okay number one two three seven you gotta get in that cell and then the person would be like oh gotta get in the cell or something like that so I, as you could imagine people didn't really take it seriously mm-hmm. the, you know on the first day but by the second day they started to take it slightly more seriously yeah they they all went to sleep and when they woke up things changed a little bit started getting a little more aggressive the guards started some psychological almost warfare tactics against the prisoners because when the experiment started the guy uh philip zimbardo he brought in the guards first and he told them okay here's how it's gonna be your job you're not allowed to hit them you're not allowed to physically injure that's the prisoners yeah they were not allowed to physically injure the prisoners however you're going i want you to do some psychological games with them 
them, remember, this is an experiment, blah, blah, blah. I want you to try and be guards. And uh, that's that's how we started off on day zero. Day one, they came in, everything was sort of all right. But then on day two, those psychological games started playing into the equation. So over time, uh, the guards started to get more serious about their roles, and they started imposing punishments, for example, on meaningless things. Yeah. I mean, during the whole experiment, the guards recognized the prisoners as, you know, they had done nothing wrong, right? But for some reason, they started imposing punishments. They started restricting the prisoners for no reason. Anyway, it was just verbal punishment, too. That's what mm-hmm. surprises me personally, is that uh, they, they were able to kind of dominate over these prisoners from just verbal punishments. Well, here, here, here's the thing. Towards the third day, it started becoming that mattresses were one of the biggest commodities in the prison system because they wanted a comfortable sleep. So the guards started using that against them they would say oh you don't get a mattress today if you don't uh if you don't do this or that and they started imposing punishments like making them defecate and urinate in a bucket in the corner and saying oh you're not allowed to empty it today if you don't do this it started getting intense I want to remind the audience that these were normal people chosen at random. These are just people that you go and meet. If you went to a college, if you went to a high school or whatever, if you walked out to someone on on the street, these are the types of people that would resort to this type of dehumanization. Yeah, and here's the thing. They... They locked someone in solitary confinement by putting them in a closet. Um, one person who was sort of a replacement for a few of the prisoners, cause some of the prisoners actually left because it was so intense. But one of the, one of the prisoners who was sort of a replacement, um, was like, oh, I don't want to fit into this role, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not, uh, subject 416, I think it was. And they locked him in the closet and the guards were like, all right, prisoners, bang on the closet door and shout, 416. Well, he's locked in there. Wow. Yeah, it it was some intense stuff. And the thing was, eventually the prisoners seemed to forget that they could leave. They just accepted the submissive prisoner role, even though they were saying, oh my god, it's so terrible in here, you know, like, they were being subjugated, but even at their, at the darkest times, you know, when they could, instead of sleeping in a room with a bucket of urine and feces in it, they could just leave. They didn't. They could just go back to their comfortable home, but decided to go on with the experiment, which meant that Philo Zimbardo, I mean, he's kind of a good guy for doing this, but he ended the experiment after just six days i think it was supposed to last two weeks Mm -hmm. but he ended it after six well it wasn't even philip zimbardo who called off the experiment his was it his wife yeah well his wife to be basically everyone who walked in on the experiment sort of got caught up in the thing and nobody was let was talking about how morally wrong it was and then his his wife came in not wife wife to be he was dating her at the time i think she was a grad or undergrad student and she basically pointed out to him, do you realize what you've done? Do you do you realize what you're doing here? You're dehumanizing people. People are defecating in buckets. Like, what are you doing? And then he sort of broke out of his role as the prison, uh, the ultimate authority of the prison and realized, whoa, this went way too far. And then he shut it down after day six. So one of the implications of this experiment is that uh, the prisoners kind of accepted their roles and the guards mostly accepted their roles as well. And it was so bad that they just accepted their roles that it had to be ended after six days that it was unethical. Imagine people who have been in prison for 10 years. Yeah. And it's not even that they just have accepted their roles. They're forced to be in that position. It's much worse. And this is considered unethical after just six days. Imagine how unethical, I mean, some prisoners of war camp, that, that would be way worse. Here's, here's the caveat. There's some, there's some criticisms of this study because, well, it's a very, interesting event that happened its rigor has been called into question for example i think one of the most scathing examples of the sort of lack of general rigor about this uh, exercise was that a, a group ran a study where they basically said okay let's run the same ad that philip zimbardo ran for his experiment you have to run an ad to get people to join your experiment so that you can have 
you know, subjects. And they ran the ad with his wording and with more neutral wording. You know, they ran one ad with, oh, this isn't a prison system. They ran one where it was just classified as a psychology experiment. And they found when they mentioned a prison system, they got more emotionally unstable people, people who had more authoritarian, who had, who had more authoritarian psyches, you know? They got a lot more aggressive people than when they got, than when they did it with neutral wording. So there's a little bit of selection bias with uh, Philip Zimbardo's findings. I think it's also important to note that this was only done once, and of course they're not going to do it again if they ended it because it was unethical. So there's not many conclusions you can really draw from an, an experiment that was just done once. There's one more thing I want to mention because it's kind of a cool thing about the Stanford Prison Experiment. There was one guy in it. Uh, he he eventually be, uh, became called John Wayne, I think, in the prison system, and he actually came in with the explicit goal of making the experiment progress faster. He he. Had admitted later that he started seeing how far he could push the other guards and the prisoners like he was he was the one who pushed that second day into into what became the third day and the fourth day and became the closet um the the closet you know banging on the door thing he pushed everyone into that the defecation buckets everything but the most surprising thing he found was everyone rallied behind him eventually. Nobody was like, whoa, you're going too far, John Wayne. Um, so it kind of puts a spotlight on the idea that there needs to just be one leader, and then that leader pushes people further in a direction for some ideology or whatever. Yeah, and that also leads very well into our next uh, yes. thing. Because if there's just one person leading people to do a, a whole load of crazy things and unethical things, then that definitely backs up the research uh, for the Stanley Milgram experiment. If you're just tuning in, this is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. The next experiment we're going to talk about was the Milgram experiment. This was done by a social psychologist named Stanley Milgram in July of 1961. It was later published in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology in 1963. To put yourself in the shoes of one of the people going into this experiment, basically you saw an ad and it said, oh, for $4 of your... We'll, we'll pay you $4 and you can, you know, go participate in this memory experiment. Just want to do some tests on memory basically just let it off as a regular psychology experiment and they went over to the basement of the university that he did it at so it's it's similar to a lot of so social psychology experiments in which the subjects are told one thing but the experiment is really about something greater yeah so they all the subjects were told that it was a memory examination and the way it was set up was that the people that were being experimented on would come in and there would be some experiment are there showing them a series of electric shocks so they would say you know they would they would give them one of the lower level electric shocks and they would say so this this machine shocks the person who's attached to it yeah and they would show the dial that increased the shocks and they would say at this point if you give someone a shock at a, at a shock value of 10 let's say then it is lethal it will kill the person and basically what you're going to be doing in this experiment is you're going to be asking people a series of questions whether they can remember something for for more specifics on the on the memory test, I believe it was like a word association thing where they put one word in the front and another word in the aft, like a blue turtle or something, and then they would have four options of the word for them to pick from. And basically, it it was tested in like quick succession, you know, just to see how many of these two words they could memorize, or at least so the test subject was told. And of course, the memory wasn't really what they, it was being tested. Absolutely here. not. It never is with these old time psychology experiments. Well, probably also that we're talking about humans being evil. You could just tell that it has something to do with the shock and not actually the memory <laughs> yeah. part. Memory is evil. <laughs> okay. 
So the people they were being experimented on, they weren't actually giving shocks or they weren't actually administering the memory test at all to a real person. Yeah. Most, uh, I, I think in the original experiment, they were just doing it on actors and the yeah. actors weren't even receiving the shocks. But in- here's, well, here's how they set it up. Basically, the, um, the, the subject of the experiment was called the teacher in their paper. And the teacher would sit and basically say when the, um, when the learner was correct or incorrect you know by shocking them if they were incorrect and the experimenter would sit you know not too far away from the teacher and just give him instructions like oh shock him you know because he got it wrong he would basically guide the experiment but essentially the subject or the teacher would be the one doing the shocks and would be calling and and the setup the setup was the buttons wouldn't actually lead to an electric shock. They would lead to a recording. And when they hit the button, a recording would play. And it would, it would be a recording of the actor screaming. And the actor behind sort of the glass, I don't know. They would, they would start at some point, they would start banging on the glass and things like that. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Oh yeah, they wouldn't. The experiment would essentially start out as just kind of harmful elect, I mean, sorry, not harmful, harmless electric shocks. Yeah. So it's more of like a slap on the wrist type of thing. But eventually the recordings of the actor got more and more intense. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, the actor started yelling, saying, let me out, let me out. Like, I don't want to do this experiment anymore. And every single time when the subject or the teacher got nervous or they would look back to the experimenter and say, hey, should we let him out, you think? Then the experimenter would always respond with, no, keep going with the experiment. This is for science. You can't just opt out now. Yeah, I, I think they had they had four different phrases that they would use. This is for the th- this is why this was a more rigorous experiment than the Stanford prison experiment. They had these phrases that they would use things like um please continue the experiment requires that you continue uh it's absolutely essential that you continue you have no other choice you must go on they said those in in sequence and you know they'd question it they'd say the first one then they'd question once more say the second one question again third one if they question again if they, if they question even the third thing where it's absolutely vital, they say, look, you have to keep going on because we're doing this experiment. You have to keep doing it. And if they said, no, I'm not doing it after the fourth response, then the researcher was like, okay, the experiment's over. You can go. And one important part of the experiment is that the electric shocks got more powerful every time. So what, they weren't just yeah. administering the same electric shocks. So at a certain point, they got the, the teacher had to administer an electric shock that would be lethal to the person in which the teacher thought it was a real person on the other end. There's no way for them to know, of course, that it was a recording. So they knew that they were administering electric shock, and yet they still did it. They still administered the electric shock, and that is what is surprising about the experiment. I... What's... What's surprising about the experiment, before he did this, Milgram did a survey of 14 students at his university, and he also interviewed his colleagues and faculty members, and they would generally say, oh, you know, one, one, a tenth of the first percentile of people are going to move and do the actual supposedly deadly shock. Well, most people would just yeah. think it's sadistic, or maybe narcissistic yeah. people that would do it. But it turns out nearly, what is it, 60% of people? 60% in his initial trial. Yes, in his in his initial trial, 60% of people went through with the final, what they were told was, I believe, a 440-watt shock. So let me just repeat that, because that is important. 60% of normal people are willing to to kill another person well, if it's required. Yeah. The, the the important thing is, though, uh, Milgram tried to connect this with the Holocaust, right? He tried to say, oh, you know, the people in the Holocaust, they were pushed by authority figures. Um, but there's been some criticism of that because it doesn't truly add up. Sure, this is a demonstration that in the presence of an authority figure and under high pressure and in a small time frame, without time to think or react or really consider the moral implications, people will follow an authority figure. Most of the time, people will, essentially, it's a toying cause. 
a coin toss. <laughs> it's kind of like the Stanford prison experiment. <laughs> yeah. It's essentially a coin toss, whether they're going to, you know, uh, follow the authority figure or say, whoa, I'm out. I'm not going to do this anymore. Well, it's even more than that, because I, I think it's greater probability than a coin toss. Remember, these people had no prior experience with these experimenters. So they were simply following this random authority figure. Imagine mm-hmm. if it was their own father or something telling them to administer the shocks. And not only that, but Milgram did follow-up trials where he demonstrated that there are ways that you can increase the number from 60% to even 90%. Yeah. One of the ways that he did it was instead of the people administering electric shock uh, just on, on manually on the board, they would send a text saying administer the electric shock. And they demonstrated that the proximity between the teacher and the person getting shocked matters. But it's it's more of just how, how willing you are to detach yourself from the situation. Mm-hmm. Because since Sending a text, you're not very you're not very attached to the situation. It's not easy to uh, comprehend that simply sending a text could kill someone. They're, they're, they get a text that says the person didn't do their job. Send a text to administer the shock, and they found that ninety percent of people are willing to go through with the text yeah. because they're just not able to put themselves in the situation. They're not able to see that sending a text can be harmful. They're not willing to see the consequences of their actions because it's hidden behind a barrier. It's hidden behind something. And another really interesting thing, people accused the study of saying, oh, well, you you did this study at a prestigious university. Of course people are going to listen to the experimenter there. So Milgram was like, Okay. And he did his next trial at this destitute location, just like sort of midtown, you know, kind of a shifty looking building. He led people in. It barely affected the results at all. It wasn't statistically significant. The thing that affected it was the proximity to the authority figure and the proximity to the person getting the shock. And this kind of uh, speaks about something that's probably intuitively obvious anyway. It's that it's 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 very easy to hurt people per- on a personal level, like hurting random people in your life, you know, hurting family or hurting strangers is, is harder than hurting people across the globe through some type of barrier. For mm-hmm. example, scamming is very popular. And, but if you scam someone in person, it would be a lot harder than scamming someone from India in the United yeah. States. You know, you, you always hear about people whose job it is to scam in person talking about oh how much of a terrible person they feel like but i feel like phone scammers and email scammers don't have that same connection they don't have that same emotional response because it's so easy to detach themselves from the situation and not realize what they're doing as they're scamming or even i mean even if you realize what you're doing it still is they just don't they don't put themselves in the same situation they don't think what if I was right there scamming them? Would I have been doing the same thing? And that's exactly. what the Milgram experiment, that's mainly what they found very surprising. All right, for all you people on YouTube... This is a YouTube exclusive, by the way. You would not hear this on the radio. Yeah, well, I mean, because we (laughs) ran out of time. But yeah, this is going to be a little bit more casual, less uptight. This is is YouTube. We can Right, we can do whatever we want, which, I mean, how much is there really that we can do more? (laughs) I don't know. I I can... We we wouldn't need to censor anything, but I'm not going to be say anything worth of censorship anyway, so... I mean, you're sending people from the radio to YouTube, so you might as well have the same standards. <laughs> <laughs> what? YouTube doesn't have standards. What? We don't. We don't need these standards. All right. Uh, let's... Okay. We were talking about Jane Elliott, so don't don't click away. Yeah. This is uh, Jane Elliott was a school teacher, a third grade school teacher, and she, you know, she was pretty normal in in terms of school teachers. But uh, one day when Martin Luther King was shot, yeah, I think it was three days after Martin Luther King Jr. got got shot so she uh one of her students came up to her and asked her basically like why did this happen like how can society hate people so much which already once you've listened to our previous two experiments you probably understand a little bit about why people can hate that much but jane elliott saw this as an opportunity to teach her children in person practically why people hate each other. I think a, a, a quote from her is she paraphrased, because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but a, a quote from her is, how could I teach these children this all-white classroom from a sort of... I mean, if I'm not mistaken, this was a bit of like a racist area. 
I'm not sure whether it could would really be classified as a racist area. I mean, I'm it was sure. a racist time. It was a racist sure. time, of, of course. I think it's mostly just the community was yeah. all white. Yeah, and um, I actually saw a video um, from the classroom when she was introing this. I never got to watch the full thing. I'm going to rely on you for that. But at the intro to the video, she said something along the lines of, we should treat all men equally, right? And then the whole class was like, yeah, you know? And then this was a really odd ex- thing to hear but she then asks are th- is there anyone that's exempt from that and one of the little kids this little like boy you know third grader like pipes in with his squeaky voice and he's like black people <laughs> and it's like holy oh my god like jesus and, and then other people start chiming in like asians and things like that and they just list all the non-white ethnicities so certainly a different time yes yeah, certainly i don't, a different I don't know time. that i think that was a different video than the one i watched oh okay well, well the one the one i watched was her doing it in the modern day and you know maybe we should describe the experiments mm-hmm. uh it, so it, it's basically like there's there's a view that uh children are completely non-racist mm-hmm. so assuming they're non-racist then you'd expect the experiment uh To not work on them, right? Because they wouldn't hate any groups of people. But just like the Stanford Prison Experiment, and just like Milgram, pretty much everyone can be victim to hate. And yeah. what what she did was she basically said, okay, I'm going to discriminate the classroom on factors that aren't usually discriminated against. So I'm going to choose eye color. And I think her analysis of using eye color was the same gene, at least um, this was her analysis in the 60s, the same gene that controls skin color controls eye color. It's all pigmentation. Yes, it is. That's so, I, Yeah, she says that. Yeah, so, she, so she's saying it's just as ridiculous to discriminate on someone based upon on the color of their skin as it is the color of their eyes. So there's, I mean, there's not much you can do in terms of like uh, systematically discriminating against people in in a school. But she would do things like uh, she would she would tell all the brown eyed people or whatever group she decided to discriminate first. I forget which, mm-hmm. but it was basically a brown eyed. She, she discriminated blue, blue eyes first. Okay, so she discriminated blue eyes first, and she basically told them you're inferior to the brown eyes. And of course, just like the Stanford Prison Experiment, they're probably like, uh-huh, yeah, this is a joke, right? At yeah. first, but she would every day. Make sure that the blue people knew that they got worse test scores. Yeah. Or and, whatever. And and she'd she'd give special treatment to the brown eyes. She'd give them She'd give them extra helpings yeah. at lunch. And sweets. You, you know, she'd she'd just she'd just really pamper these these brown eyed people and until they let, started internalizing the fact that they were superior to blue eyes. And she'd let the brown eyed people sit at the front of the classroom, and of course the blue eyed people had to sit in the back. They couldn't have any yeah. movement. So the brown eyed people as had as much freedom, they had extra recess. Mm-hmm. So all of those factors are pretty minor, but they mean a lot to kids. And yeah. of course, they're going to mean a lot if some kid isn't getting what you're getting. I mean, unfairness is very natural and built into humans. Mm-hmm. So I, of course, they're going to have a negative response to this. The blue-eyed people, they they start to think that maybe they are actually inferior. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's not just a joke. The brown-eyed people think the same thing, but the opposite. Maybe they think they're actually superior. And what Jane Elliott observed was that after a week or two of doing this, that the brown-eyed people actually got better test scores and that they actually turned in their homework on time more than the blue-eyed people did. And then I think uh, she eventually flipped that around so that the other side could feel discrimination as well. Yes, that's that's a hallmark of her experiment, that she makes sure that she flips it around to point out that it doesn't really matter who's at the top and who's at the bottom. Mm-hmm. It's just if you're at the top, then you end up doing better no matter what your eye color, no matter what your skin color, whatever. It, yeah. That's all irrelevant. It's just the fact that you are at the top that matters. And I think this this is actually more hopeful than anything because a lot of people say, oh, this is this is about the worst in humanity. But I think that it shows it shows that this is a social construct and something that can be changed. It's not something that's ingrained into people. The, the sense of superiority is simply a social construct construct that can be built up by humanity but can also be torn down by humanity and another interesting thing you may think oh for something as silly as eye color discrimination only children can be taught to discriminate based on eye color well they uh have done the experiment on adults yeah and there was uh in channel four on in britain they did this experiment on live tv with jane elliott herself Mm -hmm. and they found out that people get extremely angry i think 
it's it's different from what I've seen with adults. It's more of just that they get angry at the experimenter, and with children, I think they internalize it more. Yeah, but it's also it's easier to make children internalize things. That's basically what they're doing. That's the point of childhood is internalizing a bunch of stuff so you can right. learn society. But the but the but the adults they mostly saw it. I mean, throughout the entire experiment, they were just like, "Oh, this is absolutely ridiculous." So they would say things to Jane Elliot like, "You're stupid. Like this experiment means nothing. I'm not a racist. Why are you?" accusing me of things. And she just took that as an opportunity like, aha, you're yelling at me that you're just proving how much of a blue eye you are. Yeah. And then it, that's what destroyed them. That's what made them become part of the lower group. And the thing is, the group that was given special privileges, even in adults, ended up feeling superior and saying, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe those, maybe there is something up with those blue eyes. Cause I always, I always had a problem with, uh, Janet down the street and she was a blue eye. She always sends the mail to the wrong address, you know? <laughs> they, they just did think they, they eventually developed a superiority complex. It, it's very, it's very interesting. Yeah. Humans are very good at picking up factors in other people that unconsciously determine like their judgments yeah. and it's it's interesting to know that it's not just skin color something as simple as just institutionalized eye color discrimination can become very powerful in a matter of of just weeks yeah i mean the whole the whole point is that if this, if it's that bad after a few weeks then how bad would it be if you were taught your entire life that you were worse than these other people exactly and uh, it I think it's a really powerful analogy for the 60s as a time, mind you, because often in those groups, especially in, in the children who are, who are built up with that, uh, internalization of their role as blue eyed or brown eyed, they, they eventually, they eventually will say something, right? But it takes like one in a thousand, you know, even even worse chances than that for someone to come up and be like, hang on, hang on, us blue eyes, we are not inferior. So it speaks to the strength of the leaders of the civil rights movement. Right, honestly. because they were they were told their entire lives that they were inferior and that any chance to change that was useless. Yeah. At, as children, it was internalized by this just oppressive society. And then somehow people like Martin Luther King were able to rise beyond that, and that that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's the thing about pointing out the dark side of humanity is it's always it's always a little dark. It's always a little evil, but then it highlights the good. Well, I think it shows that even with how evil humanity is, we haven't really fallen apart yet. No, and so and we're, there we, has to be some good to balance that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If if if, you, if humanity was really all evil, I don't think the civil rights movement would be where it's at today. I don't think uh, women would have the rights they have today. I don't think the Slavs would have become unenslaved. <laughs> Yeah, no, there would have been institutionalized uh, discrimination, and it would have stayed throughout the ancient times all the yeah. way to the modern. But it shows humanity has a good streak, you know? It's nice. An okay streak. Okay. Uh, good streak. Uh, okay, yeah, you're right. We we haven't really done much about uh, about climate control or anything like that. We haven't. Or wealth inequality. Or, shout yeah, shout, shout back out to uh, episode, episode two. two. <laughs> woot woot. Watch episode two. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll link to it. Okay, but yeah, this has think... uh, been a web exclusive for what yeah. really matters. It's the, not... the first part of the episode wasn't exclusive, just the last few minutes yeah. here. All right, um, this has been What Really Matters, casual Jane Elliott discrimination edition. <laughs> All right, I think that's, think that's it. Goodbye. <laughs>